ओके वेलकम गाइस इन दिस टॉपिक वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द मॉलिक्यूल इंसुलिन सी व्हाई इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस मॉलिक्यूल इंसुलिन सी इंसुलिन इज अ प्रोटीन इंसुलिन इज अ प्रोटीन मींस इट्स अ मेड अप ऑफ अमीनो एसिड सो इफ आई गिव यू अ क्लिनिकल को रिलेशन व्हाई इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू अंडरस्टैंड द मॉलिक्यूल इंसुलिन कंपोजिशन सी द डायबिटीज मेलाइटिस वी कैन से दैट डायबिटीज मेलाइटिस we can divide particularly into two types there are some other categories also but we can divide into two types one is called as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus iddm or non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus that is called as niddm iddm or niddm iddm means insulin dependent means for the treatment you have to give insulin you have to give insulin because the beta cells are unable to fire there is autoimmune destruction of the beta cell that is occurring beta cells are responsible for the insulin secretion and i am now i am saying that if there is autoimmune destruction the insulin will not be fired from the beta cells and there will be a absolute deficiency that is going to occur and this insulin you have to supplement from outside whereas in the non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus insulin is there but there is a resistance for the insulin receptors the insulin receptors are not working there is a resistance that is called as non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus so right now i am concerned about the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus for the treatment we need to give insulin now before 80s before 80s we do not had the human insulin available in the market so what we were using was instead of using the human insulin earlier we were using because human insulin was not available in the market so what we were using was we were using the insulin of that was derived from the pig that is called as porcine insulin when this porcine insulin was used as a treatment for insulin dependent diabetes mellitus it was leading to allergic response it was leading to allergic reactions it was leading to allergic reactions it may lead to anaphylaxis also the reason was there was a certain difference that was there between the human insulin and the porcine insulin so the immune system was able to detect it and once the immune system will detect it as a foreign particle it will lead to allergic response will lead to anaphylaxis and so on so the ideal treatment for insulin dependent diabetes mellitus is a human insulin now to make human insulin in such a large amount there are certain hurdles that we that we have to face first we need to have the what is the composition of insulin means how many amino acid are there which one is the first which one is the second and so on if we know the sequence of this amino acid we can replicate that sequence in the lab multiple times by the recombinant technology and we can make that insulin multiple copies so to know the sequence to know that sequence what is the first task the first task is we require the the sample of the human insulin right once we have the sample then we can do the sequencing once we have the sequence then we can make the multiple copies so i can say that the first thing that we need to do was that the first task was the extraction of the human insulin the first thing that we have to do was the extraction of extraction of human insulin the first time extraction of the human insulin was done by the scientists with the name of benting and best these were the scientists who did the the extraction of the human insulin for the first time from the pancreas they have taken out the insulin for the same the nobel prize was given to the john macleod john macleod got the nobel prize for the same the reason he got the nobel prize the work was done by benting and best i am saying the work was done by benting and best and the nobel was got by the john macleod the reason was he was the hod of the department as well as the director of the institute so he got the nobel prize and along with that uh, he has shared with the benting this nobel prize so benting and john macleod got the nobel prize for the for extraction of the human insulin for the first time then once we had this human insulin once we had this sample of the human insulin available with us now what is the time it is the time to do the sequencing part so sequencing of human insulin s for sequencing was done by sanger this is so was done by s for sequencing s for sanger was done by the scientist sanger Sanger used a reagent. Sanger used a reagent to do this sequencing, and the name of that reagent was one fluoro two four dinitrobenzene. 
सेंजर हैज यूज वन फ्लूरो टू फोर डाई नाइट्रो बेंजिंग टू डू सिक्वेंसिंग सेंजर हैज यूज दिस केमिकल टू डू द सिक्वेंसिंग सो दिस दिस केमिकल इज रेफर्ड एज सेंजर्स रिएजेंट सो दिस इज वॉट दे आस्क इन द एग्जाम दैट वॉट इज सेंजर्स रिएजेंट सेंजर हैज यूज अ केमिकल टू डू द सिक्वेंसिंग एंड द नेम ऑफ दैट केमिकल इज इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड दैट इज द वन फ्लोरो टू फोर डाइनाइट्रो बेंजिन दैट इज रेफर्ड एज द सेंजर्स रिएजेंट नाउ वंस वी आर क्लियर विद दैट वंस द सेंजर डिड द सिक्वेंसिंग वॉट यू फाउंड वॉज दैट ह्यूमन इंसुलिन is made up of two chains is made up of two polypeptide chains means two chains of amino acids are there two polypeptide chains are there two polypeptide chains so it was looking like this there are two polypeptide chains say for example this is the first chain and here is the second chain so there were two chains of amino acid they have labeled as a chain and the b chain there are two chains a and b what they did was that uh, these a and b chains they were held together with the help of the disulfide bond a and b chains they were held together with the help of the disulfide bond and this entire unit was referred as insulin this entire unit was referred as the insulin if we look closely the a chain consists of 21 amino acid whereas b chain consists of 30 amino acid so human insulin was basically 21 plus 30 comes out to be 51 amino acid so this is what the sanger uh, found that human insulin is made up of two chains a and b they were uh, held together there were two polypeptide chains they were held together with the help of disulfide bond and that is making the human insulin and that consist of 51 amino acid in the beginning of the discussion i told you that earlier we were not having a human insulin so we were using the porcine insulin we were using the porcine insulin and that was leading to anaphylaxis so let's figure out why it was leading to anaphylaxis if i compare the human insulin with the porcine insulin if i compare it what we notice that human insulin is made up of two chain a and b a consist of 21 b consist of 30 comes out to be 51 amino acid but when we see in the porcine insulin a chain is same 21 amino acid are there a chain is same but in b chain there are only 29 amino acid so comes out to be 50 amino acid so the terminal amino acid that was there in the b chain of the human insulin it was missing in the porcine part and that is why it was leading to anaphylaxis right so human insulin 51 porcine insulin 50 amino acid this is the first thing that we need to understand and remember now the when it comes to the clinical correlation why this entire discussion is relevant to us see we know that uh, let's say this is the pancreas in the pancreas we have the the beta cells these beta cells continuously fire whenever there is a stimulation by glucose these beta cell will fire and the molecule that they are going to secrete the molecule that they are going to secrete is one is insulin they are going to secrete insulin at the same time and at the same quantity they will secrete one more molecule that is called as c peptide they are going to secrete one more molecule that is with the name of c peptide if there are let's say two molecules of insulin is secreted two molecules of c peptide will be secreted so the amount of the insulin and the amount of c peptide is going to be exactly same the beta cells whenever they will fire they will they will throw two things in the circulation one is insulin and another will be c peptide and both will be in the exact amount both will be in the exact amount so what is the use of knowing this thing see let's say there is a patient comes to you a 23 year old male 23 year old male and he is having he is coming with a symptom of uh, weight loss he is having weight loss uh, unintentional weight loss Uh, for last let's say around one year he has uh, lost around 10 to 12 kg there is no history of fever there is no other history there is just a significant weight loss history is there for last one month you did the random blood glucose the random blood sugar or the random blood glucose comes out to be let's say 327 mg per deciliter means it is going to be very high coming very high you did the hb1c hb1c comes out to be 10.2% means again it is going into a diabetic range so you have made a diabetes uh, you have made a diagnosis that he is having diabetes diabetes mellitus 
Now the question is that he is having which type of diabetes? Type 1 or type 2? Now looking at the age group, it is more likely going towards the type 1 diabetes. It is looking like type 1 diabetes. Now what is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes means there is a beta cell destruction by the antibodies, right? That is autoimmune, uh, we can say mechanism is there that is destroying the beta cells. If the beta cells are destroyed, the insulin will not be made, right? And there is one more molecule which, not, which, which will also not be made is the C-peptide. So, in type 1 diabetes, we can say that the insulin level is are going to be on the lower side, that is true, but at the same time, the C-peptide levels are also going to be very low or going to be very low. So, the same concept we are going to use here. If I want to confirm the diagnosis, which investigation I will do? Which investigation I will do? Right? I can do two investigations. One, I can use the insulin level. I can measure the insulin level, whether they are normal, high or low. The second, I can use the C-peptide level. Now, the good thing about the C-peptide is the half-life of C-peptide is very much more higher than the insulin, where the insulin is having a very low uh, T-half. Means, if you take a sample for, of the plasma and you measure the insulin level, it might happen in a normal person also, you might get a false low result because the insulin will be metabolized very fast. Once it will come in the circulation, it will metabolize very fast. But the C-peptide will remain for some time. Right. So, what we do is instead of taking insulin level, we measure the C peptide level because they are having the same value because the, 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 the quantity of the insulin that is going to come into the secretion from the beta cell will be same as C peptide. So, if the C peptide levels are normal, we can say insulin levels are normal. So, which investigation we will do? We will do the C peptide level. We will do the C peptide level. We never measure the insulin levels. We never measure. We just measure the C peptide level and based on that we can make the diagnosis. This is one thing that you can do. The second thing you can do is as I told you that is autoimmune disorder. Right. So you can see the antibodies also. That is the autoantibodies against isolate cell. So you can check the isolate cell antibody. You can check GAD antibody. So there are various, the list is very long, but for now, the point of discussion is if I want to make a, a diagnosis of the type 1 diabetes, the one thing that I can do is I can measure the level of C peptide. I can measure the level of C peptide and that will give me a hint that whether the C peptide, if the C peptide level is low, yes, we can, we are going into right direction. It is a type 1 diabetes. The insulins, uh, the beta cells are not firing, they are getting destroyed. So I can say that based on this decision, I can say that C peptide, is a marker of endogenous insulin is a marker of endogenous insulin right if you want to measure the insulin you will measure the c peptide that will give you an idea the second thing is if we want to make uh, i told i am saying that insulin half life is very less right and for the treatment of type 1 diabetes you have to give insulin from the outside so, the patient that uh, you will treat in your OPD, you will prescribe human insulin and that human insulin, the, the maybe the bottles or the pains, they will take their home and they will uh, inject on their own for maybe one month, maybe two months, they will, they will again come back, they will take the new insulin from you. So, what I am saying is that if uh, the half-life of insulin is very less, then how it is going to remain there in the bottles for one month or in the pains of the insulin pains which are available in the market that will remain there for one month or maybe more than that. See, to increase the half-life to or I can say to increase the shelf life of the insulin, what we do is we add zinc. If we add zinc, what happens is the insulin will be crystallized and the crystallized insulin, the shelf life of the insulin increases. So, I can say the zinc is added Zinc is added to increase the shelf life of human insulin. And how it is going to do that? Zinc will lead to crystallization of the insulin. Zinc leads to crystallization of insulin. And once the crystals will be made, it is going to be the half life or the shelf life is going to be increased right so these are the points to be remembered the important point i am highlighting the c peptide is a marker for the endogenous insulin c peptide is a marker for endogenous insulin so these are the points to be remembered in respect of insulin yes thank you